today, we finish our exploration of Genghis Khan. Hello and welcome to Body Count, the podcast where we believe history doesn't repeat itself, it does rhyme. I'm your host, Jessica Manor, and I'm joined today by... Frank Garcia. Um, just want to thank everybody once again for having me along, and especially Jessica. It's been quite the journey with this one. It's been a long series, but I'm glad, uh, for one, we're going to get to move on to the next big thing, but I feel like everyone's a little bit more up to the divvy with Genghis Khan now. I would agree with that 110%. I feel like everybody's up, everybody's ready to finish it out, and we'll be We'll be doing the next big one soon, but we will take a break for our normally scheduled ass clownery, definitely, in between. So, you guys know we're done with explanations, disclaimers, officially. But we ask that if you love the show, please subscribe. That's very, very important. Rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, it's so important on the business end for us. It's not about our vanity, um, but we don't hate it either. Honestly, though, it's all about business. So hit those five stars and you can say whatever the hell you want in the review as long as you give us those five stars. So we're kicked back on our various couches. We're about to break down some seriously disturbing history. Only rule when we choose a subject to discuss someone or a lot of someone's, as is usually the case, die. If you're listening to this episode, go ahead and back it on up for us. Start with part one of Genghis Khan, because this is a multi-part exploration of the life and times of the great Khan. And we're going to jump right in because I desperately need to be done with this, you guys. I'm going crazy. And plus, we just have a lot to cover today. The amount of hours that have gone <laughs> into this, you know, just talking back and forth, making sure, you know, what the research and stuff we did matches up. I just wish people could see the backside of things, but I'm glad we're able to like mold not this negative connotation of Genghis Khan like we had at the beginning, but now it's a little bit more like people can see through the see through the mud a little bit more now. I agree. Um I just feel like if we were going to do it, we were going to do it right. I feel like we've done it right, really and truly. We've spent the time but you're exactly right. Uh, outside of the hours that we've just spent recording, and there have been a lot of those, going back and forth with notes, going back and forth and going through everything. And you kind of get an idea through Twitter what we've been going through. And so we're excited always to bring these multi-parts. But now it kind of gives you guys an idea why we have to take breaks in between and do our short, fun, one-off episodes. So we ready to dive into this? Yes, me. Or it's a it's a last one, so let's let's get this started. Let's get it going. So when we left off with Genghis Khan building one hell of an empire, looting the shit out of the Jerche Kingdom, and now he's headed home. And of course, while he was gone, a few of the conquered tribes got fresh and were playing around at doing their own thing, which always a bad choice, knowing what we know about Genghis Khan's feelings on loyalty. There was a lot of violent death, I'm sure some backbreaking, as they were really fond of that method, but to say the least, it took like 2.5 seconds to just lay waste and reestablish the pecking order on the step. So that clears the way for this massive flood of goods from the now rerouted Silk Route to spill all over the step. Genghis Khan now had complete, undisputed control of the Silk Route between all of China and the Islamic empires. The poorest of the poor are now just dripping in gold and wearing all of the finest silk. It looks like Nordstrom threw up all over these people. So even distributing things far and wide, the new Mongol Empire found that it had more shit than it knew what to do with. Which Genghis Khan welcomed, him, you know, welcomed as he was always a man with a plan. He thought, hey, I have all these extra, I don't know, mother of pearl combs and Tons of silk scarves and shit we don't really have any use for. We don't really make anything these big old surrounding empires want. But I can make us the center of the empire by controlling trade. Genghis Khan thinks, finally, all right, I have what I need to just chill. East meets West. We can connect people, make friends. Be almost like this central bank, I suppose, would be the closest thing I can describe to like a modern day what maybe what he was trying to establish. So Central Asia and the Middle East, or what we would roughly call it today at this time, 
there live the most advanced civilizations in all of the known worlds, and they happen to make something Genghis Khan really wanted to get his hands on. Steel. Not only that, but some like sweet, sweet cotton. They knew how to make glass, etc., etc. Now, the gentleman that controlled the closest of these kick-ass empires, Orizam, was a Turkish sultan by the name of Muhammad II. And Genghis Khan really wanted some of the shit Muhammad II was selling. Now, he could have just showed up without knocking and tried to take it, but he didn't. That wasn't really Genghis Khan's way, though. Really wasn't. Especially now that it seems he just wanted to settle down and live out his days on the step. He hadn't had all that much time to really devote himself to teaching his unruly sons how to rule. Genghis Khan instead seeks out a trading partnership. I mean, why not? Genghis Khan has nothing to fear, east, west, north. You would have to go a long way south to even find something not in his control. So to his mind, he had everything he could possibly need. I mean, it's a good idea. So are you with me, like, so far? I'm with you. You know, it's it's crazy to think this Silk Road is just like a small little mention in some of this. I know there's so I, – I, we could go another two or three podcasts just on the stuff about the Silk Road, um, all the goods that poured out of there. You know, we, we have to remind people that his – the people that followed him were – Always on the move. They they're not used to seeing this kind of um, so word I'm looking for like treasures treasures to them. You know, yeah. This is, it's almost like overwhelming for them to have these goods now, and they're like, well, I don't, I have no idea what to do. What what is this? You know, exactly. So I can kind of see where he was going with this, and I think it's an absolutely ingenious idea. What do you have to offer these empires? Well, you can control the trade of all these goods that are coming in and out. And, and kind of harness all of that for your own and spread it far and wide and be in control of it. It was a thing that they could essentially, they didn't manufacture anything, but it was something that they could make. So Genghis loads down a big old delegation and three ambassadors with some of these sweet, sweet goods he's getting from China as a present for Mohammed II and sends them with a message of peace, basically saying, hey guy, like, you want to trade and be bros, which the sultan agreed to rather reluctantly. Still, everything seemed all good. Genghis sent a follow-up caravan with more good faith items, but, and I swear to God, there is always a but in this story, because someone always has to fucking try this guy. Um, so this greedy-ass governor, who was a relative of the sultan's, seized all the goods and killed all the merchants Genghis had sent with the goods on their way to the sultan. It was written of this action that the attack not only wiped out a caravan, it laid waste to a whole world. So, Frank, any guesses on what, like, to what is about to happen based on just that terrifying statement? I mean, if we could take a guess <laughs> just on the past, that, you know, magnificent brain of his that has the ability to just conquer is about to just lay down the dick of the law on these people. Oh, right. Like it's uh, least to say Genghis immediately sent envoys directly to the Sultan to ask, what the fuck do you think you're doing? And what did the Sultan do? He made the wrong choice. I can tell you that the Sultan rebuked Genghis Khan for questioning him in the most public and offensive way possible. He killed some of the envoys and mutilated the faces of others. He sent home to tell the tale which Genghis Khan didn't tolerate the stealing of animals in his own kingdom. So imagine how he's going to take this news. And not only that, but it wasn't long until the steppes and the empire entire of Genghis Khan were abuzz about what happened, and eventually Genghis Khan himself. It was written, The whirlwind of anger cast dust into the eyes of patience and clemency, while the fire of wrath flared up with such a flame that it drove the water from his eyes and could be quenched only by the shedding of blood. Like, the fuck? I can't describe it any better than that, so I just went ahead and quoted. I mean, Genghis Khan abhorred the shedding of Mongol blood, after all. And, and, on top of that, he didn't like being spit on. After all, it's not like the Sultan just took a parking spot he could see Genghis had been waiting on, and now Genghis Khan was coming for him. 1219, the Mongols descended on the Sultan's empire, and this time, there was no quarter given. 
This was about to be the kind of slaughter Genghis Khan is known for, man. Like, rough. Let's discuss this campaign because nothing stood in their way. There was no bribing, no escaping. Nothing was left untaken. So are you ready? Let's dig in deep. Let's get this going. Yes. So... The stomping grounds of the 13th century Islamic empire were home to the most sophisticated and richest civilizations on the planet at the time. They were the kings of knowledge, learning, and sophistication. And because it was at the top of the mountain of civilization, it had a long, long way to fall. And the empire of this sultan had some troubles before the Mongols popped up. The usual political rivalries, religious disagreements, and just plain old cultural hatreds. The Sultan of Orizam was considered an upstart Turk who didn't have a lot of allies within the ranks of his Muslim bras and the Arabs and the Persians. They sort of saw him as a, a barbarian conqueror too. So, you know, this guy isn't exactly off to a great start because the Caliph in Baghdad was like supposedly inviting Genghis Khan to go ahead and crush the dude. Now, that one may not be true, but let's just say that the deck was stacked against the Sultan. His own family was even at one another. His mommy had just as much power as he did within a kingdom, and it was his uncle that had robbed the caravan that caused the kerfuffle in the first place. The masses of subjects in his cities were against this asshole, and his Turkic soldiers were stationed in cities to keep everyone in line more than to defend them. Genghis Khan had sent half of his army in a straight shot march from Mongolia, but he himself led the other half across a 2,000 mile trek into the back door and deep behind enemy lines. Then the shit started. The army numbered altogether around 100 to 125,000 Mongol horsemen. Add the core of Chinese doctors and engineers, you had an army of around 150 to 200,000 men. The Sultan had just under half a million to his name and were enjoying home field advantage. But Frank, do you think that helped him at all? No, not at all. I mean, if we look back, kind of <laughs> kind of think about his past with war and just understanding the battlefield that he's about to go into. I mean, no, no doubt in my mind, this is uh, this we're going to see the Genghis Khan that people are used to seeing that just brutal SOB that just didn't give a fuck. That's what we're about to see. You would be exactly right, because Genghis began his advance with the same promise he always made when he rolled up on a spot. Surrender? We give you, like, the reverse Olive Garden treatment. We're here, your family. Offer the Mongols food, shelter, and you are granted protection and familial rights. Refuse? Might as well kill yourself because you were an enemy and an enemy of Genghis Khan was essentially already dead. Genghis Khan had many a scribe and this Islamic empire had many of their own. Thus, we have an idea of exactly what he would actually tell people when he rolled up on a city, village or outpost. So when it's little, you know, something like this. Commanders, elders and commonality. Know that God has given me the empire of the earth from the east to the west. Whoever submits shall be spared, but those who resist, they shall be destroyed with their wives, children, and dependents. Um, and I don't suppose you can really get any clearer than that, I guess. Um, and some cities, they give up straight away. That was no contest, but others fought. And Genghis Khan applied all the lessons he had learned from his jerked conquest. He captured city after city, but this time he knew what to do afterward, especially when it came time to loot and destroy said cities. Before they got to the plundering and the raising the city to the ground part, Genghis Khan had to dispose of the inhabitants. So all enemy soldiers were instantly slaughtered, which is a given as the Mongols didn't have any use for infantrymen and wanted no standing army behind them and their way home. To tor like no torture, or weirdness, or anything about it. It was just quick, quiet efficiency, you know? I mean, kill them as quickly as possible. There's shit to do. After the soldiers were all dead as doornails, the Mongolian clerks were sent to comb the civilian population for anyone skilled. Genghis Khan wanted all professionals like more clerks, doctors, astronomers, judges, soothsayers, engineers, teachers, imams, rabbis, or priests. Most prized folks 
on the list were essentially merchants, cameleers, bilingual individuals, but no one more than the craftsmen. Mongols could only herd, hunt, and fight like a mother, but they had an empire now. Like they needed the proverbial sausage to get made, which meant taking in people with skills they didn't have in just about every service aspect imaginable. Smiths, potters, carpenters, furniture makers, weavers, leather workers, dryers, miners, paper makers, glass blowers, tailors, jewelers, musicians, barbers, singers, entertainers, apothecaries, and cooks. But the people with no occupations, well, they didn't fare as well. They got to help prep for the attack on the next place, which meant, you know, carrying shit, digging fortifications, human shields, dead bodies to fill moats and run siege engines over, just whatever, the usual. But fucking awful as that sounds, no one, and I mean no one, got it worse than the aristocrats. Nations in Europe... And the Middle East, um, they didn't kill enemy aristocrats. They took enemy highborn captives so that they could essentially ransom them back to, you know, for money to their families. Oppressive rich fucks couldn't see their way to killing each other. It was for the common man on the street to die. The 1%, you know, they kind of tend to stick together. Now, knowing what we know about Genghis Khan, do you think he did that, Frank? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we if his, history will tell. I mean, we know we know what's what's happened in the past, but I mean, he did not like these aristocrat bitches. I guess you could say they just thought yeah. they were better than everybody else. They you know they act like their shit didn't stink, but little did they know. I mean, they're gonna have it coming. Oh yes, and Genghis Khan, you're exactly right. Didn't give two shits about any of that, nor did any of the Mongols, for that matter. They sought out the aristocrats and slaughtered the pompous asses. It was how the Mongols guaranteed 100% victory, which at the end of the day, we know is all they really cared about. That was honor for them. So how do you stop a future uprising? Cut off the head of the snake, as it were. If people have no one to rally around, they are far more likely to integrate swiftly and easily into the Mongol empire. Genghis hadn't always had that policy. At first... He allowed others to rule themselves as long as they paid tribute. But so many of the people that he had conquered, most recently the Jurchit, had all turned on him as soon as the army withdrew. So no more of that. Genghis Khan had learned his lesson. And he had seen all that he quite frankly cared to see from the rich and powerful when it came to a total lack of dependability, usefulness, and loyalty. If you had an office... It was conferred on you upon the Mongol by the Mongol state, and it died with you. No title was retained unless conferred on you by the Mongol state. The lowest-ranking Mongol could walk before the greatest king of any other nation as long as you were within the Mongol Empire. When they left a city, the Mongols left nothing worth a shit behind them. So to those conquered within the Sultan's empire, there was... No one more terrifying than Genghis Khan. All their scribes were quick to spread the word about it, too. And rather to stop it or get pissed, Genghis loved that shit and, like, encouraged them to spread the word far and wide. This guy never missed an opportunity to exploit a situation, I can tell you. So, highly literate general population? Perfect. Especially as Genghis Khan's flair for, you know, propaganda. And nothing can crush the spirit like pure, unadulterated terror. Genghis Khan wanted all the worst yarns out there circulating. And he would actually send out delegations to the next city to, like, hand out terror pamphlets, I guess. If he could terrorize a city into surrender and move on, all the better. Every victory gave Genghis a new found, or, you know, a new round of fodder to propaganda flood the streets of the next territory and it spread belief that he was almost invincible and not like that mark Wahlberg and that shitty football movie kind of way invincible like truly invincible and it wasn't all bullshit because while mongols didn't torture or mutilate or like just generally maim those that they conquered uh they killed just like a lot of people, so many people, unprecedented in living memory of the time kind of numbers, which to the Mongols, it was just essentially a policy matter, really, a means to scare the shit out of the next domino because cities were falling like 
dominoes. So does that like make sense to you? Yes. I mean, falling like dominoes, I feel like is an understatement because it was just, he was just knocking them out one by one by one, just, you know, doing what he did best. This part is where we're getting into what people see him as, right? Like in real life, not the, you know, the tough childhood he had. Also, that Mark Wahlberg movie is just not a good <laughs> movie. One of one of his no. worst ones. One of his worst ones that he's put out there. But because I'm a big Mark Wahlberg fan, um, but I just being a Cowboys fan, I don't even like the Eagles that much at all. Right, like already. But then it's just like every time I see the word invincible and it just kept saying it in so many of the texts over and over. And I was like, yeah, but this is real invincible Mark Wahlberg. That's all that kept ringing through my head, you know, because I'm 12. Yeah. So when we look at this and you're right, we're we're about to get into the parts and and we're getting there. We're going to get into Genghis proper soon. But. Before we do that, I feel like we got to do a little prep because compared to other civilized armies at the time that were dragging captured enemy bodies behind horses through the streets, like playing ball games with human heads, flinging live children at city walls. And yes, these were things that were all happening in other parts of the world at the same time. The Mongols, they didn't fuck with all that stuff like that was just to them essentially a waste of time. People were so terrified, not by like the cruelty of all these super metal acts. They were terrified by just the speed and efficiency they applied, they applied to taking a city and killing off who needed to be killed. Again, they didn't mess with it. You couldn't bribe your way out. No one was spared. It was just kind of a put them up against the wall and next group sort of thing. And this really scared the shit out of the aristocrats of the day because they mattered no more to the Mongols than the lowest among the societies they conquered. Some of the cities that surrendered were just shocked to find how cool, though, that the Mongols were when administering their cities. Now, these were the cities that took the deal and just opened the gates. And Genghis Khan was good to his word. They were given familiar rights of a sort. So, When it was time to move out, Genghis Khan would only leave a few Mongol administrators in the place that were in that place. And again, they were so cool that the people of some of the cities began to doubt all the stories that made them surrender in the first place. And once the Mongols moved on, they got a little big for the britches and thought, eh, they're gone and they won't come back and revolted. But as we know, Genghis Khan always came back. And if you made him turn that wagon train around, God help you. Now, these were the cities where Genghis Khan did earn some of his super freaking metal reputation. Utter and complete annihilation. Because if you left nothing, you wouldn't have a revolt on your hands ever again, essentially, would you? Okay. And now we're going to start straying into, I'll do this little prep, maybe myth, maybe some truth. No one really knows, but it's important to understand how all the information about Genghis later on gets a little twisted, um, you know, into bloodthirsty barbarian only. So are you ready, Frank, to get to some real hardcore Genghis Khan, like Genghis Khan stories? Let's do it. I'm ready for this. Okay, so. The following story may or may not be true. Again, let me prep you. But it's certainly recorded by a number of people at the time. So again, remember, a lot of the sourcing on this is shoddy, even if you spent your life studying this stuff like our source, Jack Weatherford. But apparently, one of these cities pulled this shit after the Mongols left. And when they came back to take the city, Genghis Khan's son-in-law was killed. Genghis Khan goes to his now pregnant widowed daughter and says, Hey, kiddo. Fuck. You get to do whatever you think is appropriate to these people that couldn't just be cool and now your husband's dead. And supposedly she said, fuck them, kill them all. Again, according to the widely circulated but unverified story, she had Daddy Genghis and the Mongols pile the heads of the dead in three separate pyramids. One for men, one for women, and one for the children. She then ordered all the animals in the city be put down so that nothing would outlive her husband in that city. In another battle, Genghis Khan's favorite family member, a grandson, was killed. Genghis Khan didn't mourn. In fact, he ordered that there would be no shedding of tears. 
all grief was to be channeled into killing. Lots and lots of killing. Because no one in that little valley community was left alive. Not a single one. So, yes, I mean, Genghis Khan was a scary, scary dude. Please don't get it twisted. Now, a conservative death toll people like to cite for just this campaign is somewhere around 15 million in five years. I'm here to tell you that, in my opinion, that's bullshit. My opinion, based off of information supplied by people who devoted like their entire academic careers to studying just Genghis Khan. Now, the logistics just don't work because that's like 350 to 1 or some shit. Even city by city, it's like 50 to 1, and people aren't cows or sheep. Fear is going to kick in. They're going to escape, fight back. People aren't animals to be slaughtered, no matter how good the Mongols were at it. Archaeological evidence of the raised cities seems to support about a tenth of that, which shit, I mean, that's still an incredible amount of people for just a hundred to 200,000 soldiers to kill. And these places are desert dry areas where bones hang around for hundreds, hell, even like thousands of years. No one has found a trace of 15 million, but again, please don't get it twisted. Genghis Khan killed an incredible number of people just on this campaign alone. But he was better known at the time as a destroyer versus like a people lawnmower. Genghis Khan salted the earth a lot, but he wasn't destroying cities, and I mean like the structures, for the fun of it. He was destroying cities that weren't all that important or were weird outliers on the Silk Route. If you take out even the foundations of a place, no one's going to go back there to trade. Genghis Khan was effectively reshaping the Eurasian Silk Route into a focused easily controllable single trade route with the cities that he did spare, even those that he took, he left the city structure itself. Now, at the time, the Silk Road looked more like a river with all of its hundreds of tributaries versus like a classical Roman road. All these places were spread far and wide. The Mongols couldn't easily control that. But a single route, however, because that's where the cities were, well, that was pretty easy pickings. Does that make sense? Am I making sense or am I rambling? <laughs> uh, it's making sense. It's, you know, the I wish, you know, we had a, a true number. But, you know, like you said, it, there's not somebody, a scribe or somebody taking notes at each place, counting each dead body. You know, it's almost un, I don't want to use the word impossible because nothing's impossible, but it almost is impossible to try and get a definite number and keep track through all this time. You know, like, oh, well, at this one he did, you know, 10,000. At this one he did 357. It's it's almost unrealistic to keep track, but it's good to get a number out there, but a more realistic number. Yeah, I mean, it really, it's difficult to keep track, and I don't want people to, to get it twisted, but there also is, we do have the evidence of cities he was essentially leveling to make the Silk Route closer to what it would be when Marco Polo would encounter it and kind of what we have in our minds. At this time, it's just spread far and light, which to me is, again, it's just so genius. It's a really, truly genius move by this guy to, even though he's pissed, even though he's here because he's mad, he's still got empire building and not a total destruction, not a total laying waste He knows that eventually this will be his and he could still make something out of it. And so, yes, he did do some monstrous things, but there's also a sense and a purpose to it. He's such an interesting figure to me because he is just such a dichotomy. So to make it easier for the Mongols to control and monitor Genghis Khan depopulated the expansive areas of land between the cities by destroying irrigation systems. This cleared out villages and farms um, because you can't grow shit without irrigation and, hello, grazing land. And a way to feed a Mongol army that would no doubt be hanging around. After years of kicking ass in Central Asia, Genghis Khan was in his 60s. The Mongol conquest finally stops at the city of Multan in modern-day Pakistan in the summer of 1222. After jumping out of the mountains of Afghanistan and rolling out on the plains of the Indus River, Genghis Khan considered just conquering northern India as well. I mean, he was there. But the geography and climate put 
a stop to his advance for maybe the first time ever. Once the Mongols left the dry, colder mountain region, the warriors and horses started to weaken and succumb to illnesses. Their systems weren't prepared for a climate so different from their own. They certainly didn't have the immunities as yet required to deal with all the new diseases. The entire place was basically like a, a smallpox blanket. More importantly still, though, the Mongols' bows and their, their horseback archery was a large part of what made them such effective killers. They were amazing at adapting to the extreme hot and cold, dry climate they were used to. But the humidity weakened these bad boys, making them way less accurate. And the Mongol warrior way, way less deadly as a result. So, eh, Genghis Khan said, fuck it. And he had conquered the Orizom Empire. And that's all he really gave a shit about. Central Asia and a big old chunk of the Middle East was now part of the Mongol Empire. Genghis... Khan, he, he headed west in 1219, cross a mountain or a massive ass desert to drop in deep behind enemy lines and claim the glittering jewel of Bukhara, taken every major city in the Horizon Empire, and left the Sultan abandoned, alone, and dying on a teeny tiny island in the Caspian Sea. So, end of day, Genghis Khan was now officially king of the world. Like, maybe not the whole world yet, but a pretty fucking big chunk of it. The Mongol Empire now had a firm grip on the Silk Route from Islamic empires to China. So he finally headed home, and here it comes, Frank. It's inevitable. Are you ready to start winding down the march? I mean, all good things have to come to an end, right? Eventually. And I mean, to live in your 60s at the, you know, in the 1200s, I mean, he's already basically, I'm sure people thought maybe he was kind of immortal. I don't know. Like everybody probably died in their freaking 20s. Now, even Genghis Khan knew he wasn't immortal. And he was about to set out trying to kind of settle his unruly sons and establish a clear successor. But in all this time in the traveling kick ass show, Genghis Khan had not devoted the time he needed to making a son's men in his image. There was some deep enmity running between his boy children, and toward the end of his days, Genghis Khan despaired at what a bunch of idiots he had neglected to raise. But he spent some time trying to prep them, teach them all he knew. And maybe he was just tired, tired of messing with his idiot kids, worried everything he had achieved was going to go down the drain. Maybe he knew the empire needed constant conquest to survive. Maybe he just wanted one last chance to mount up and reign some terror, whatever the reason. And despite his age, Genghis Khan jumped at the chance for one last quick conquest. Before he left to crush the Horizon, one of his first Chinese conquests, the Tengut, had refused to furnish troops for the Horizon campaign. And Genghis Khan never forgot a slight, if we've learned nothing else. More likely, he was there to crush any remaining aristocracy, and he did, and just assumed complete control of the region under the Mongol state. This was one of the groups that he had left as a vassal state. After that, he most likely planned to, once he had unified control under the Mongols, after that, he most likely planned to jump off from there and crush the Sung dynasty that was not yet under his control. He had been distracted by the Sultan and all of his BS. Now, Genghis Khan was injured during a hunt on the campaign trail, had a raging fever, but still, he pressed on with the campaign under his control. His health, though, never recovered. Six months later, and just a few days short of final victory, yeah, even at death's, like death's door, this tough son of a bitch was still, like, crushing civilizations, Genghis Khan died. And while the secret history tells us everything he fucking ate and like every minor detail about every horse this swinging dick of history ever rode, it doesn't tell a shit about the manner of his death, which little annoying. And we remind you, our topic is Genghis Khan, guys, not the Mongol Empire itself. And so that's where our part of the story ends, but not the story of the Mongol Empire. Now, we're going to kind of get deep here. Despite Genghis thinking his kids grew up to be idiots, the Mongol Empire continued. 
the like the empire campaigned not for years but generations. In just 25 years, the Mongols managed to eat up more civilizations than Rome managed to do in 400 years. At its height, the Mongol Empire was between 11 and 12 million contiguous square miles, roughly the size of Africa. 30 countries, 3 billion people. And in the days of Genghis Khan, with a tribe of around a million, of that million, about 100,000 made up the fighting force. Let me remind you once again that no matter how you do the history math, total number of people defeated, countries added to empire, or area occupied, Genghis Khan conquered more than double any other man that has ever walked the earth in living history. He really, truly was history's biggest swinging dick, and the exception, more importantly, to every rule in history. We're talking about a man that stomped around Siberia in the middle of winter. It's truly incredible, and remember, as long as this series has been, We have just, just scratched the surface of Genghis Khan. That's why we tell you every week to go and check out the books written by people that have devoted more than a couple weeks in a few classes back in college. And it's been a while for me, guys, to the study of Genghis Khan, starting with Jack Weatherford's Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World. Now, when we started this knowledge quest, Frank, we wanted to explore if Genghis Khan was, as later civilizations and historians portrayed him, the monster in the closet, a bloodthirsty savage that just loved to wreck shit for the sake of wrecking shit. So some quick thoughts, and then I'll kind of take us home with our whole Genghis wrap-up. Do you feel that way about him? You know, I'm I'm back and forth. You know, growing up, I I thought from you know taking I was always in AP classes, so we always went above and beyond in those. Um, and I learned, and I said it at the very beginning that Genghis Khan was just this brutal son of a bitch. But you know, there's a reason behind why he kind of formed and fit that bill. But at the same time, we didn't. No one ever told me or us that. Hey, this guy accepted people. They they wanted you to see just that little portion where he's like, he's bad dude. Like, even though he conquered, he was a bad dude, which he wasn't 75% of the time. I'll give it that. I think that's it's, a good, yeah, 75% of the time. It's also, we went over his death real fast. But if we go back to those earlier episodes where we kind of talked about it more in depth, you know, more facts, there's not a lot. I mean, there's TV shows, there's... Netflix documentaries, there's Discovery documentaries, Travel Channel, where they have sent people and they can't even get access to even places in Mongolia where they think he's at. It's so secretive that it's it's almost, you know, it kind of pisses you off because it's like, we need this final piece. We get this final piece. We're like, look, you know, cat's out of the bag. We're good to go. Let's wrap this up. All right. Sounds good to me. So, The Mongols and Genghis Khan in popular culture are often synonymous with suck. We spoke in our first part and throughout the series about just what all Genghis Khan accomplished, from the rule of law to religious freedom. Genghis Khan and his Mongol descendants opened the world to new commerce, ideas, and knowledge. Because of Genghis Khan, the Mongols built the modern world in big ways and in small ones. German miners made their way to China. Use of carpets became the norm everywhere they went, and God knows, did that stick. Chinese doctors made their way to Persia. Noodles, playing cards, and teas made their way from China to the West. Buddhist temples found their way to Persia. Lemons and carrots from Persia found their way to China. Christian churches were built in China. Metalwork left Paris and built foundations in Mongolia. Quranic schools popped up in Russia. English noblemen served as interpreters in the Mongolian army. Fingerprinting made its way from China to Persia and eventually the world. And that's just to name a few things. Products and commodities traveled the then known world over. Furthermore, each culture's ingenuity combined with others to make new products and inventions of which the world had never even dreamed. For example, engineers from China, Persia, and Europe threw together Chinese gunpowder, 
Muslim flamethrowers, and European bell casting techniques to make the cannon, which leads us to pistols and eventually missiles. The Mongols combined all forms of tech and information to pair it in ways the world couldn't imagine decades before. So despite Genghis Khan's illiteracy, the Mongol Empire eventually adopted a zeal for politics, economics, and intellectual achievement. It wasn't about just breaking down civilizations, and yes, they destroyed quite a few, but it was about putting them back together as one big, awesome, creative machine. It was about instituting a new order based on free trade, international law, and even a universal alphabet. Eventually, the Mongols introduced paper currency and universal primary schools so that Everyone would be literate. They produced calendars more accurate than any previous and put together extensive collections of maps. So yeah, the initial conquering was fucking rough, but it was followed by unprecedented cultural communication trade and overall improvement. Now, Europe suffered the least because they just didn't have as much shit to take as the Islamic and Chinese empires and civilizations, quite frankly. But it acquired all the knowledge that a brush with the Mongols had to offer, resulting in new technology, knowledge, and commercial wealth. Starting in Venice with the Polo family, jump-started the Renaissance itself. And all of this started with Genghis Khan. And yeah, he could be fucking rough. There's no doubt about that. But we don't live in the world that we live in today without Genghis Khan and the Mongol Empire. Small wonder the longest story in Canterbury Tales is devoted to Genghis Khan and his accomplishments, which is amazing as Chaucer was the first English language author in history. Renaissance authors wrote of Genghis Khan with awe and reverence. Genghis Khan was no savage to those guys. But Genghis Khan was repainted during the Enlightenment period's downright anti-Asian racism. The growing sense of sedentary and thus often white European civilization superiority falsely attributed all democratic ideas to European tribal origins. Asian civilizations were then summarily dismissed. It was there that the Mongols became the symbol of evil and defectiveness that we, you know, essentially discuss going into this series and kind of what we think of when we think of Genghis Khan. When authors and playwrights were too afraid to criticize their shitty monarchs outright, they used Genghis Khan as a smokescreen. Please see Voltaire. Scientists at the time let their racism leak into their works as well, painting Asians and particularly Mongols as some kind of subhuman monsters. And Genghis Khan was first among them. And so racism and misunderstanding grew through the centuries. And, and quite frankly, they live on today. And that's what I took away myself from this exploration. Is it our fault that we forget history? Do, as a culture, we let others in the name of nationalism and imperialism essentially rewrite history? Genghis Khan rose from those ancient tribal pasts that we all share to shape the modern world's notion of commerce, communication, international secular law, and secular states. That shit wasn't born in the Renaissance, guys. It was born with Genghis Khan. Do we forget these things that are important because we're too lazy to go to the source ourselves? Are we almost content to neglect the truth for these nicely cobbled together bullshit tales that were told by aristocratic assholes that Genghis Khan so despised? This is why rewriting history is so very dangerous to me. And furthermore, it's just sad. We lose all of those things that made the human race as awesome as it has the potential to be today. So to me, and because we always like to bring it back when we finish up a series, the lesson here is that history isn't something that fits neatly together in a book binding or in a documentary. When these things happen in the course of human history, especially those things that are unprecedented, and in this particular case, violent, the outcome tends to echo through the, the ages, you know, long after it happened. And sometimes they have no real end. 
Genghis Khan and his accomplishments, both the good and the bad, still affect us today. It's real food for thought. So, speaking of food for thought, Frank, what are your thoughts? I mean, you you summed it up a lot. I mean, we we didn't even plan this for you know what I was going to say, but it, I mean, you took the words right out of my mouth of just literally everything. I, this the part that I like to to hit on is how he shaped kind of what we see today. And the part that really affected me was just seeing his system of like courts and taking people to, you know, have their their punishment and like having all the higher people who are with him just say, hey, you know, this is going to be your punishment. We're going to make you do this. Like I feel like you can take it from what he did then and apply it to today, you know, kind of put our American spin on it or just our time of the world spin and see how much what what he did is still in effect today. You know, you took the words out of my mouth of a lot of things that I was going to say, and I don't want, really want to w- repeat them, but I would just like to hit on that that kind of court system that he made is still in effect today, if you think about it. I mean, exactly. And yes, there were civilizations prior to that. We look at Rome, uh, Athens, all those things are mirrored in what we see, but none of it would have touched as far and wide and come together again. And, and even Europe coming out of this and I hate the term the Dark Ages, but I'm going to use it, whatever. Coming out of that in this Renaissance you know, period, all of that is made possible because of Genghis Khan. And when you hear that name, just knowing what we know now and what we've kind of gone through on this, it almost makes me sick that, that it's got such a monstrous connotation because... We don't live in the world. You're exactly right. We don't have, and our justice system isn't perfect, but it's better than than a lot of alternatives. And when I look at it, I think we don't have that without Genghis Khan. We don't have the idea of religious freedom without Genghis Khan. Those things were reintroduced and respread throughout the world by the Mongol Empire. These were not barbarians. I mean, they could be bloodthirsty. Again, don't get it twisted. Like you said, about 75%. (laughs) When we went into this, I just really didn't expect... Because I was kind of like you, even from my background, you know, it's a couple weeks you talk about the Mongols and then you move on. Even now, within our education system, it doesn't get the attention. I feel that it really and truly deserves. And it's all there because either we're too lazy, we don't go to the source. And so I found out so many things in the course of doing this little exploration. And I had a lot of freaking fun. I will say that. And I'd like to point out to people, like, I am not a history major. I I do watch a lot of documentaries. And, you know, I did not meet Jessica through Twitter, social media that, you know, our my fiance and her were work together. And I would always pick fun at, you know, some of the stuff that she would talk about. <laughs> but it really, you know, interested me that, you know, when she first came to Madison and talked about it, you know, like, hey, what do you think are some good things? And I'm like, dude, I love podcasts. Why don't you ask me? And. I started throwing stuff out to you and, you know, here we are now with our, with a legit first big, you know, multi-series podcast that we took a lot of time to kind of make sure. Oh, it- so much ever. Like I really cannot drive it home enough to people. And I have to thank you so much, Frank, because again, one, absolutely. We were bouncing so many ideas when we were talking about this podcast and I immediately bit when Frank said, How about Genghis Khan? But I wasn't expecting to learn as much as I did. And I certainly wasn't expecting to do this much work because I can't tell y'all the amount of work that Frank did, the amount of work that I did, like just comparing notes, the hours that have gone into this monster, like monstrosity. So we have to thank you guys for sticking with us and being very, very supportive. And we are aware it's been long. It's been a lot but we have, are so thankful for the outpouring that we've gotten really and truly on this Genghis Khan series. Yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to the next big part. I mean, I know you've got some other things to, to you know, touch up, but I'm not going to say what it is, but I, I hope people will enjoy the next couple of things that are coming up. And I mean, it's crazy to think that this conversation started with me throwing out like 
th- thoughts about people getting injured by easy bake ovens. <laughs> and I don't know if you remember that, but I it do. was a it was a good time. You're like, someone actually died from an easy bake oven. I'm like, you know, like one we could do like a a small short story about it, and then <laughs> <laughs> then we we're like, all right, we're gonna take on the belly of the beast. We're gonna do Genghis Khan. I'm like, we just went from one to fifteen million, <laughs> but oh, okay. We just jumped from one to fifteen to thirty million. You know, thirty countries, but okay. It, yeah, no big deal. And thank you so much for being on board with that. And I promise, guys, we're gonna get to easy bake ovens. Which brings me to my next thing. Um, we have started up a Patreon. Right now, we only have one tier, so I'm going to talk about it really quickly. That's Bethany and I, and then Madison's going to, I'm going to rope her into joining. Right now, we're just watching historical dramas and kind of mystery science theater, 3000ing them. But I'm also going to, we're going to set up a couple more tiers as we move into it. And Frank and I are going to do some of those fun, short, little product stories from history that they're they're those 30 minute one-offs that don't really fit into our episode arc so there is a lot of stuff coming um so an entire podcast that started pretty much from like the number of people that have died from easy bake ovens and i think we were talking about some kind of whirly bird toy i had back in the 80s and 90s that killed a whole bunch of kids lawn darts (laughs) And we were talking about lawn darts. Yes, so many lawn darts. Um, Kids so getting, hit, getting hit in the back of the head and then, <laughs> oh, sorry, your brain stems just got decapitated. Sorry, internally decapitated. You just got Genghis khan Good for you. Um, your back is broken from a lawn dart. Yeah. So in the future, as we move on to, uh, into Patreon, we're going to be doing that. Frank is always going to be joining me when I do these long explorations. And then we're going to go back. We're going to go back. I know a lot of people love the one-off episodes, too, where we do, not that it's ever exactly silly, but where we do the little things like Quebec Bridge or sometimes we cover historical true crime, stuff like that. And we're definitely going to get back into those. We're going to have Madison and Bethany back, but I just want to kind of make it clear to everybody introduce that idea that Frank will always be on or with me on these really big, long explorations. We're going to do them, but we also have to take a break because again, the hours and hours that have gone into this are overwhelming. That's essentially going to be our little counterculture wrap up really today. Just kind of getting on those deals, talking about what's coming on Patreon, talking about what we already have on Patreon To that, we have our first patron, and I want to throw a big thank you out there. First off, if you've not listened to this podcast, please go listen to Despair and Distress, guys. It's absolutely fantastic. But Wifey went ahead and joined us for all of our Patreon fun today. Wifey from Despair and Distress. Um, You can find them through our Twitter. You can find them on Twitter. It's so much fun. Please go check out their podcast. You will really enjoy it. Do you have any quick plugs on anything else, Frank? I'm good. Um, we're we're plugged out. We're exhausted, yeah. guys. This has literally killed us. Thanks again, uh, you know, for all the love on Twitter and Instagram. I've greatly appreciated it. Kind of and actually enjoyed getting to understand Twitter. I mean, you're like, dude, you're young. Do, do you not social media? I do, but I'm more of a Facebook or Instagram. I never <laughs> liked Twitter. Um, but I do appreciate, you know, Jessica showing me some love out there and people following and I'm, I'm going to try to be more active, but I can't make any promises. That's good because I can't make any promises about Instagram. It's just so much work for me. But guys, I do like live on Twitter. I love Twitter. It's 110% made for people like me that just want to throw their smart ass like thoughts out into the world for whatever reason. Like anybody gives a shit. But we're going to wrap this one up because we're exhausted. We've barely made it through, but we finished Genghis Khan. So, um, Again, get ready for some big announcements that are coming up in the future. I won't say anything more about it than that at this current moment. Uh, Patreon's getting up and running, and we're going to be adding to that and doing some different things for that. If you love the show, again, please don't forget to subscribe. That's so important. Rate, review. Follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Body Count Pod and Body Count Pod on Facebook. I can be found at Jessica B. Manor on Twitter and Instagram, but mostly Twitter, as we've already covered. So where do people find you, Frank? I am on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Instagram's at, at the Frank Guy Garcia. And then Twitter is 
at the Frank underscore Garcia. I know. I'm sorry, Frank, Frankie. Uh, I won't even get into begin to talk about that. <laughs> you, you, you have your first professional job. People don't like to call you Frankie, and then they get used to you, and they call you Frank, and then they're like, wait, why do people call you Frankie? And I'm like, it's a long story. It's a long story. That's why, see, I'm so glad I jumped onto the scene later where I could just come up with my nice Jessica B. manner. But God knows most people don't call me those things either. It just is what it is. They're already there. We're not going to change them. Um, you can definitely get to Frank's Instagram and Twitter through mine. He's plugged all over there. So you can definitely find him there if you've already got me added as well. So I think that wraps it up for everything that is in our Genghis con series i had a tremendous amount of fun i am exhausted so is frank and so for that reason we are going to talk to you guys i mean obviously quite literally next week and we are out thank you